So what did you guys do last time? Group I, I motivated groupoids. Well, I tried to motivate groupoids nearly as far as I thought my mind would let me do. But we talked about turtles. 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 So, so we're going to talk about higher turtles. <laughs> we're going to talk about higher turtles today. Okay, so, okay, so let me put up the definition of a quasi-category, and then we'll go ahead. So a quasi-category um, is a simplicial set satisfying the weak confidence. Okay, so, so I guess Amari and Luke told us what a simplicial set is, and today I want to focus on the second part, the weak con, the weak con condition. And so, remember, this is supposed to be this quasi category is this is a geometric model for an infinity one category. So there are many definitions, but this is kind of, this is the one that's taking off right now. So a geometric model for yeah, infinity one category. So whatever this thing is, when you see these when you see this pair, infinity one, this means you have all sorts of morphisms, not just one morphisms, but higher stuff, all the way up to infinity, or some interpretation of. And then the one means that anything higher than one, so two, three, four morphisms, are all invertible. So it's the one here, the one morphisms may not be there, anything higher than vertical. Um, and so this is one of the kind of the, the group assignments I have today. I'm going to put up this definition and figure out when stuff higher than two is invertible. Quick question. Is infinity like a number or does it mean unbounded? Unbounded. And then we have a geometric notion, we have a geometric model for an, in, for an infinity groupoid which comes out of this. So it's called a con complex. A con complex. It's going to be a quasi category, but all the one stuff is invertible as well. So the con complex is a quasi category satisfying the con condition. So that's a stronger version of this. So essentially, what it's going to do is invert all these one morphisms as well. Um, and then this is this is our geometric model for an infinity groupoid. Um, I think I'll do a quick review, maybe. 10, 15 minute review of some special sets. I'm going to need that. Okay. All right, so a review of some special sets. Um, so we start off with delta, which is called the simplex category. Um, the objects are something of this form. They're just ordered um, lists of numbers. Okay, so bracket n just means it's ordered list. Zero to n. So n is greater than or equal to zero. And a morphism from two such objects is just an order preserving map. So this ordering is very important, and then that means any morphism between two such 
obvious respect to order. And then a simplicial set is a functor from the opposite of delta to set. Okay, so what we're doing here is for every one of these objects, we're assigning a set. And then for every order preserving map, there's a map of sets. It's going the other way, though. It's going to go from the end to the other. Okay. Um, and then, so simplicial sets form a category. Let's call it S. So the objects are just going to be some push of sets, and the morphisms are natural transformations. Okay. And so and an important idea here is a geometric violation, which, which both Luke and Omari talked about last time, two weeks ago. So there's a way to see these things as spaces, but there's a cost to this. So given a simplicial set, you can think of it as a space. Um, so there is a functor. Um, it's called two bars with a dot in the middle. It takes a, takes every from the category of simplicial sets to the category of uh, closed what's the G? Um, the compactly generated. Right. So this is compactly this category of compactly generated. Uh, house star spaces. So I understand generated, I understand compact, I'm not sure I understand them both together. Yeah, so here it is. So let's say a subspace A and subspace X we say is open, so I'm giving you a definition of this, is open in X if and only if A intersect K is open in K for all compact subspaces. Okay. So it's compactly generated. Yeah, so it means your X is going to be house door. And we say some subspace is open. If and only if the intersection is open in K for all closed subspaces. So, for example, simplicial complexes have this property. It's a complex unit of source space. Uh, so, it's a W complex. And, right, so the idea, I won't say it, but the idea here is you, you think of each one of these. Let's see, a functor, you take a simplex, let's say N. Well, n is getting back to a set. And so, say the set has three elements, what you're going to do is generate three n-dimensional simplices, your standard n-dimensional simplices, uh, which is the convex, the linear convex combination of what is it, n plus 1 basis vectors in R, n plus 1. Right? So, the standard way of turning this thing into an n-simplex, so that's what you're doing here. So, if x of this thing is, say, a set with three elements, you're going to construct three standard n-simplices. And then these morphisms are telling you how to glue them all together. So I don't understand how the set has three elements in it. I mean, like, I assign n to three different sets. I see that. But why do I care what's inside the individual sets? Well, so suppose x, n, is 
sequential set, right? So some set of set three. Right? Okay. That n has nothing to do with the three. Yeah, the, the n is not connected to the three. Is it, or is there some reason that being a functor makes it connected to the three? So could I have bracket n100 yeah. and map it to the real numbers? And so I don't even care what the set is. It's just that for all the subsets of, of n, I have various subsets of the real numbers. Yeah, so what I'm saying is you want to interpret this as, when you do this geometric polarization, you want to interpret this as three different n simplices. So if this set is a real number, then you have an n simplex for each real number. An n simplex on each real number, yes. So xn is the set of n simplices. Yes, yes exactly. exactly. You want to think of this as a set of n simplices. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you do a geometric polarization, right, we, know what the, we know the geometric polarization of this thing, the standard yes. quantum form. But you just have it three times. But if I had a circle, then I'd have a simplex triangle over top of the entire circle. Like, yes. it'd be like a fiber where every over each point I'd have a triangle. Like if it was a th if, if n was t is three, right, or two maybe if we start at zero. Okay, okay so it's a little triangle, uh -huh. and I, I have the unit circle, and I assign over every point a triangle. Okay. That's that would be a simplicial set here, right? A realization of it. You're saying x of two is a circle. X of two is the unit circle S one. Okay, so that's a set of. Okay. Is that allowed? My sure, misunderstanding. Sure. So that's context? a set. So okay. So wait, remember, this is just a set. There's no topology here. Sure. So yeah. So then that would mean that you interpret this as you have an infinite collection of two triangles, one for each point on the circle. But then you have, right, so then you have these maps. But the topology of the circle doesn't play into that at all. No. Yeah. So it's the discrete topology on that set. Wow. Okay, fine. Yeah. Right. So this means you would have three discrete n simplices. And you have some number of n simplices here, depending on what this set is. But then you have this map. That's telling you how to glue. Yeah. And so the idea here is this geometric relation, you construct each one of these simplices individually, and then you use these arrows to them together. And then you have this is topology generated. Okay. Thanks for slowing me down. Okay. Um, slowing down for me is what I like to say. Then there's an opposite construction of this, which is important. It's called the singular set of the space. Should we now think space is synonymous with compactly generated Hausdorff? Like whenever you say space, that's what you mean. Yeah, so this this actually I got well what about this one? So this there is a functor like this. Top ah. into S sub. Okay. So this is just your standard category of topological spaces and continuous maps. And so I don't know, maybe I'll let you guys guess. What is what is S applied to a topological space Y? Okay, so this means it has to be a simplicial set, and a simplicial set eats one of these. And that's produce a set. What should it be? I think let's pi see. n. Pi n? That'd be a set. It's not gonna be a functor, but it's a functor. Mm -hmm. yeah. So think, so for those of you who know singular homology, cohomology, that's how you want to think. Yeah, so your singular n simplices? The singular n simplices, exactly. These are just the singular n simplices. So you can write it like this. Right, so 
and this is your geometric realization of the n simplex. And and y, right? For the y. So what I did too far was add homotopy to that. Yeah. yeah okay. Wasn't that far off? He looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> And look, and then every border preserving map, they call it P, uh, induces a continuous map between the geometric realizations. gives us the map of S Y of some phi is going to give us a continuous map from well not continuous map, sorry, it's going to give us a set map. Right, it's a functor, right? So it sends objects to objects. Right. And it has to send morphisms to morphisms. Okay. Right, so let's so if I, if I have an order preserving map phi, well that's going to give us a continuous map on the uh, standard simplicities. Mm -hmm. Because well this is telling us how M is sitting inside of M. It's possible I have two or three points at the end of the map to the same. That's fine. So it gives us a continuous map. And then now if I have Right, if I have something in here, I should go in the other way, isn't it? Yeah, there's a conjugate of Rob somewhere. Yeah, this goes the other way, n to m. Right, so if I take, I take an element in here, which is the home set, but an element of the home set, I just pre-compose yeah. with this thing here to get an element. Yeah. Thank you. So now, uh, now you didn't say this, but perhaps it was said under, or maybe you did say it and I didn't hear it. When you put the sort of absolute values around delta n, it is just the standard simplex that we get for CGH house, right? That's what the, it's the, these are the same function, right? It's just that in this case, they happen to coincide with what I think of as the standard simplex. Yeah, so what's happening here is, yeah, I should have mentioned this. The standard n simplex here is delta n, which is defined as a simplicial set, the loop did this last time. So that's here. This is what we call standard n simplex in the simplicial set language. So this is a contravariant functor. This one delta hop into set. And right, and that thing there is exactly what I've written here in brackets. So delta n is the geometric realization of functor. This is a simplicial set. And it gives you your standard. Sorry, it gives, it gives you your standard n simplex. OK, so here's what I wanted to get out of the punchline. Um, So it turns out S is right adjoint to the geometric realization functor. So we have um, S set, that's this little top here, the geometric realization functor, and the back of this functor. So it turns out to be. I don't want to prove. <laughs> 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 um, and then here's, here's a deep there. This is, this is a hard proof. So when it comes, it says that take the homotopy category of S set and 
think the homotopy category tau. So what is the homotopy, oh, the okay? homotopy category? Yeah. Um, So are objects just the homotopy class or homotopy type of that individual object? So the objects are the same as the objects of this set, but the morphisms are different. So what you, what you do here is you say, so suppose I have in both constructions, so suppose I have a morphism from one object to another, two of them. And if I have an isomorphism between them, like a natural transformation, that's also an isomorphism. No, wait, that doesn't no, work. No, hold on. So that doesn't work. Yeah, those aren't two functors, right? If I take two spaces and I identify them if they're homotopic, uh -huh. and I preserve all the continuous maps that are now in, on the equivalence class, that would make the category, right? I contract the contractible spaces and so forth. Yeah. Okay, so I know what this is. This I'm struggling with. Uh, so okay, so here this is what this is. So you have two spaces x and y. So you have continuous functions f and g. And when we, the HO of top, what you do is you collapse F and G if they're homotopic. You make them the same. So they're called the homotopy category. So it's the same objects, almost the same morphism. The morphisms are not our homotopy classes. If they show, like, suggested the zero homology on the path of the right I think it's HO for homotopy. Oh, but it's more subjective. It should be more like, it's like pi zero. It's more like pi zero applied to the home sets. But this is the letter H and O, not H and zero, right? It's not H, yeah, it's not say a whole, yeah, whole time. Oh, yeah. You have like H capital. Yeah. And so, okay, so I find, okay, so what is, so there's something similar here. It should be the same definition. So you're, you were hoping that two morphisms would collapse or something like that. But they're not functors, so there's no such. But, I mean, if you said two morphisms, you wouldn't have to have natural transformations. You could still have two morphisms between. I could still, yeah, there's, there's some notion of a homotopy here, which I didn't bother to look up. But yeah, so just like here, you collapse homotopies. Well, what's wrong with it just being the standard growth and deep two morphism? You don't, you don't have to have natural transformations. I mean, this isn't a functor category. It's just a category with morphisms and these higher morphisms. Well, so if I have a simplicial set, I'll just use the same diagram here. The simplicial set X, simplicial set Y, they're functors, right? Simple as F is a morphism from X to Y, it's a natural transformation. G is a natural transformation. And what are you saying? Okay, James? fine, that's right, you're right. Since they are actually functors, right? Simplicial sets are functors, then natural transformations are definable between them. These are natural transformations. I mean, I don't know this theorem, so I don't know what they are, but. That seems like a natural best choice, right? If you if you look at whatever's happening here, what it's saying is that taking a simplex and pretending it's topology by filling in the dots between the corners doesn't tell you something new, right? It's just the corners of the simplex you need to know, and any kind of Euclidean geometry between them is not really helping you understand the homotopy of this. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the idea here is the same. You wanna you wanna say two. Morphism, but I was saying that you can homotop one to the other. Um, and so there should be a purely kind of a combinatorial way of writing the homotopy. But um, we can use our intuition. We have this geometric realization up here. So it's, yeah, it should feel like a homotopy. What are the right ways of writing this? It's, it's, it's the same definition on the left hand side. The two are the same morphism, but I was saying you can homotop one to the other. Um, and the big theorem here is that these two functors have a given equivalence category. And, and this is, I see this as the motivating uh, reason for thinking of a simplicial set as a kind of commentary algebraic abstraction of a topological set. This theorem. And just because I'm not a topologist, K 
Can you name one topological feature people talk about which is lower order than homotopy? Like that you couldn't distinguish if you passed to homotopy? Yeah. Um, so, so, so for example, so suppose you just have spaces x and y, uh -huh. continuous map f and g, and then let's say I tell you they're homotopic, f and g are homotopic. So, right, so f induces, let's just say homology, and more homotopy groups. If you look at homology or homotopy groups of x and y, f is going to induce a homomorphism from say, the homology of x to the yeah. homology of y. Same with g. And homotopy tells us that those maps of homology are equal. So map induced by F and map induced by G are equal because they're homotopic. So if you look at homology, you don't lose anything by going here. But you, what you do lose is information at the chain level. So it's the, the, if you look at homology, there's a chain complex associated to X, okay. a chain complex associated to Y. F gives you a chain map. G gives you a different chain map. So just at the level of space, the level of chains, when you go here, you lose that information. Were you just wanting a topological property also? Like well, I mean, I'm just trying to understand. If I, if I substitute hotop with top, mm -hmm. I'm obviously wrong. I'm losing something. Yeah. But what am I, am I losing something so fine-grained that it never shows up? Or is it that, like, no, those classic questions we ask about topology that really do show up as different at this contact. Compactness is lost? OK. Yeah, so the entire real line is contractible. Oh, true. Well, I don't mind losing the real numbers. Okay, but now I understand. Oh, Thank you. Real line so, so what Michael was saying was the, the real line is contractible. Uh -huh. Okay? And so he was saying I would lose compactness. If you don't distinguish between things that are homotopy equivalent spaces. So the real line is equivalent homotopic to a point. The point is compact. The real line probably isn't. Yeah, because it's open, right? Yeah. Oh, so I, I see. So what you're saying here is, in this category, the point of the real line becomes isomorphic. Right. And yet they have a topological difference. One is compact and one isn't. And I was just trying to understand, like, what am I losing if I accept this this new version of space? I might lose compactness as a yeah, distinctive yeah, quality. Yeah, I mean, you'd even lose dimension, right? Like the plane yep. is the same as the point. Yeah. You lose, like, all is that a thing topologists know? Is that the mention of that is consistent? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it is. Yeah, okay, fine. <laughs> you know, as an algebraist, none of this stuff surprises me because I didn't know it existed. Okay. <laughs> okay, now let's get back on track. So, the quasi category is a simple set satisfying the weak con condition. Okay, so, we're working towards composition. So, an ordinary composition has objects and arrows, and arrows allowed to compose. So you need some way of composing. Oh, by the way, this will be important. Uh, I said this, let me say it again, standard and simple. So again, we have a simplicial set here. That's our standard N simplex. Um, and then given a simplicial set, um, so X N, well that's a set. Um, by the Unita lemma, this is what Omari told us last time, this set is isomorphic to this set. Home dash n x. Which is, and this thing here, well, that's your standard n simplex. And so this is isomorphic to home s set. Okay. So the lesson here is delta n, 
sometimes we want to think of these, these are our ends. Or I should say, better think of these as singular ends. Okay. okay, so we have to talk about forms. So for each k less than equal to n, the kth horn, k horn. A subcomplex. It's going to look like this. So this is going to be a subcomplex of your standard n simplex um, corresponding you take the boundary of the n simplex Boundary of the n simplex, and then you remove the k face. And remove its k face. So let's do a few examples. So let's look at 2. So here's our standard 2 simplex. Geometric realization, let's label these 0, 1, 2. Okay, what is the zeroth face of a triangle? Zeroth triangle. It's always the opposite. So the zeroth face is 1, 2. The first face is the opposite, 0, 1. The second face is the opposite, 0, 2. Okay, so the second the zeroth horn looks like this. So you take the boundary, remove the zeroth face. So we put arrows in just to see. I did that wrong. First face. Second face. This is a tetrahedron, too. Zero, one, two, three. And so let's say the first, you take the boundary, so for example, this thing here, uh, three, one. So look at the boundary of the tetrahedron and remove the first face. The first face is this, the bottom here, the bottom triangle. If I put a 2, that means I remove the second face. The second face is this thing here. So every vertex has an opposite face. So just remove it. Okay. So this should remind us of, let's look at this first picture. Let's look at this picture. This horn. And okay, what is this? It's like it's like a con looks like a con looks like like two arrows that should be composable. Like it's going from zero to one and then one to two. And now what this con condition does is the following: it says that suppose I have a horn in my simplicial set. 
weak con condition so that I can always fill it in. I mean, suppose I have such a situation with a simple set. I write this formula, but it means that we can fill it in. I mean, we can compose. That's the definition. Simplicial set X satisfies the weak time condition. If for every inner inner horn. So inner horn just means that this k is strictly between 0 and n. Right, so in this example, there's only one inner horn, which is this thing here. Right? You, think, you don't think composition of arrows. But k is between 0 and n extends to delta. Okay, so here's a picture. So I have the inner horn. And that's sitting inside of delta m. Because okay. there's just it's a boundary, you remove a face. And so suppose I have a natural transformation like this. So this is in the category of some push sets. Suppose I have a morphism in the category of some push sets like this. I have this inclusion. Then it has to extend to an alpha bar. Meaning alpha equals this I followed by alpha bar. Okay. So let's look at this. What does this mean? Let's look at this inner horn. One, three. Uh, so we have the boundary of the tetrahedron, get rid of this face down here. And then we have all these arrows, right? So there's an ordering on here. So this zero comes before one, one becomes before two, this. This is ordering. And so what is this doing, this extension? So, okay, so we already have this alpha. Suppose we already have this alpha. And so, with alpha is, here's alpha we have, we're going from 0 to 1 and then 1 to 3. But this triangle's in the in alpha, so it's telling us how to fill it in. It's tell, best telling us how to compose. From one, 0 to 1 to 1 to 3, it's this arrow. 0 to 3 is filled in. So, what this alpha does is not telling us how to do this composition. Um, 0 to 2 and then 3. So filling it in, it's, doing it, it's telling us exactly what to do here. It's, it's, filling, it's filling this in. Um, so filling it in means that that diagram commutes there, right? And so you're just saying I now assign 0, 2, 2, 3 to be 0, 3. Because since, since it's not assigned, there's only one assignment left. Am I right? Like you have you have the you have the map. The functor is taking the zero two face to a function, and the two three face to a function, and the zero three face to a function. And so then you just say, I declare by fiat that the the face zero three zero two three is the composition of these. Yeah, I think that's the right way to say it. Right. You just declare that when you fill this in, that this this is a comp. You don't think of when you fill it in as a commuting triangle. Filling it in means like I thought we're doing all those things. I'm not quite sure what we mean by like if I have a point in the middle of that equilateral triangle. Is that yeah? Like what is that? Like we can fill in. Does that mean there's something there? Like I'm confused by that terminal. 
So there's no actual thing in the middle, it's a simplicial set, right? So it's just a functor, and it's got to assign whatever morphisms are in it, which might not include the morphism that would be on that face. That'd be a higher morphism, I think, right? That'd be a two morphism or something? Wouldn't that be? Yeah, you want to interpret you want to interpret this as like a two morphism. When you fill in a triangle, you interpret it as a two morphism. So it's like, yeah, maybe this is the way, yeah. Okay, so we have these, we have the narrow from zero to two, zero to three, and two to three. And then you're filling it in, meaning meaning you're putting in, yeah, there are many ways of thinking of it. You could in this case, with the arrow go like that, from the corner that's two towards the zero three, is that the way we should think of it? Just the orientation, yeah? Yeah, I think the so. Double so arrow. filling it in, you can think of it as this way. You're going from zero to two and then to three. And filling it in means like you're basically setting up a homotopy between zero three and this other composition. Are you familiar with the double arrow stuff, like what a two morphism is, or is this just saying more jargon at you? Uh, more jargon, but the homotopy <laughs> means. So. Okay. Yeah, you want to think. Yeah, you don't necessarily want to think of this two morphism because it's not in the language of simplicial sets, but. Yeah, so when you fill it in, what's happening here is you're forcing, you're like, okay, this composition now, you can say, it's, well, it's equal to this one, and think of it like that, or it's equal up to this, this whatever, this homotopy that, like, you can imagine this edge from 0, 2 to 3, this comp these two edges, it's kind of morphing it to that edge 0 to 3, continuously deforming it. And it's important that it be a deformation, because if you haven't filled in that face with any rules, then there's no reason for that composition to do anything. So you could have different compositions, and then you're saying, well, I'm choosing to make them equivalent up to this morphism. So when you're doing this filling, not only filling, are you filling in this triangle that we omitted, but you're also filling in this inner tetrahedron. So there's some higher compatibility thing between all these other faces. And some of my questions about this something. Filling in kind of that middle tetrahedron, because we've already established on the other, like, uh, the other three faces. Those are filled in composition work. Um, Those are filled in, so you have composition, right? <coughs> but then there's a bigger thing, and that's also being filled in by this. So that bigger thing is the composition of the consistency. Okay, so here, okay, and so that's the weak con condition. The strong condition, con condition um, you just eliminate this inner horn condition. So where k is strictly between 0 and n, you meant it to be anything. Okay. okay, so this is the group project part. I didn't have a chance to work this out. Um, okay, so this is supposed to be a model for an infinity one category. So that means all the two morphisms and higher are supposed to be invertible. So what does that mean now? Like, right, according to this, this definition, everything that's two and higher should be invertible. And with, if you get rid of the weak part, so you have a strong con condition, that means even the one morphism should be invertible. And that's implied by this filling. So if you have to set up the filling in just the right way, you can get the other the other way. You don't have a chance to do it. So the exercise would be for the weak con complex, Two more from the higher invertible for the strong con complex one in everything. So would you help me just count here for a second? Which one is the, the weird one here? When k equals zero, I remove just a point, right? Right. So when k equals zero, you're doing the same thing. You take the boundary of the tetrahedron and remove the zero at face. Oh right. Weird is with n. So if you have the weak con condition can't consider n less than 2. So maybe that's where we get stronger differentiating the two points. That equals 1. There's we'll be back no over there with the young uh, one. Which one? composition of arrows looks natural for 1, but for 0 and 2. Yeah, that's the one where you don't have a natural reason to fill it yeah. in. I see. Yeah, so, so this looks natural, right? That but looks then natural, right. For the strong con condition, you're going to have these ones in the fill too. Yeah, and if one and was that's invertible, yeah, and if it was invertible, you'd see why you would just turn it into one of those other ones and compose. And if it wasn't invertible, you'd really have to be creative to think that fill. And it's really, I know Alex told me exactly how to why this implies invertibility. I can't remember. No, but I think I see the, the, yeah, okay, so there's only two horns that will have that shape, and they are the boundary cases, that's right. 
So either all the arrows are moving towards a point or they're moving away from a point. So there's no condition to force them to commute in a natural way. So then you have to have something stronger. Now this is the assumption is if it is there, then then what all the edges are invertible? Even one all the ones are invertible, right? That's what we need. Right, yeah. So if, if this condition is satisfied, it's strong confirmation. So like we could do this by induction on n and just take the top zero to n edge and just flip that. And so we can really reduce it. Like there's another simplex from 0 to n minus 1, which is some lower simplex, but we're going to assume all of those are already invertible by induction. So we only need to fill in this one last triangle. Okay, so okay, we can just focus on this. Just, yeah, it's that picture. So suppose, suppose I have an Suppose I just have an edge in my simplicial set. And some, okay, so now I want to produce an inverse, right? So I'm going to assume strong con condition. So there's going to be some kind of degenerate two simplex here. Um, so here it's the zero one, just that zero simplex one. What's the question? Uh, I guess I'm just trying to understand the Zero horn of this. Oh, the zero horn. It would just be the point one, right? Yeah. Zero horn. Remove the zero of face, which is that. So it would just be the zero. Um, oh, you're right. You're right. <laughs> one of these two. <laughs> <laughs> There's not much else we could take away, so. It's <laughs> <laughs> So this is up to how you number them, but clearly you could either get zero or you get one as the horn. And then if you have the strong complex, you want to, I mean, my, my instinct is to say that there's like a, you go both ways, right? You know, like the standard, you, you, you do, like when you're trying to say the universal mapping property is unique up to a natural isomorphism, you just play the equivalent both ways and you compose and there has to be isomorphic. So you take the filling of the zero uh, horn and the filling of the one horn, and because there's not any space to go, they must compose to an identity or something like that. Right? There's a filling. There's a, an extension of the zero to one from the first filling, and there's an extension from the one to the zero by the second horn filling of the strong con condition. Right? Those are the, the boundaries. And then those are, I mean, there's not really uniqueness, but they have to compose. So s somehow we have to get a commuter diagram that says that those compose to the identity. Oh, uh, the zero simplex, you know, apply this condition, then you get that you have the identity map, right? Well, is it, is it already the identity? I think it could be any, it could be any isomorphism, or it could be any map, right? So the, the extension alpha hat is one of, is the line from zero to one. Right. right, and then there's a there's a beta hat that's the map from one to zero, and I'm trying to say that alpha hat beta hat is one, so that they're invertible. I mean, where else could they come from? They have to come from this picture. So, so you get uniqueness from the zero alpha. So are you saying you look at only like? Oh, because there's only a point. Kind of part of absolute point. There's only one point, so alpha is unique. Is that what you're saying? So it's a function on a single point. So alpha is just one map, and it's therefore the identity map. Okay, I think Luke's got it. So in that alpha over there, it's a point to a point. So there's only one map, and it might as well be the identity map because there's always a map between them. So he's pointing out that 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 ha because that's a point, because the horn in each case is a point, there's just a unique thing it can do. 
So that I is an identity map, and therefore the extension is just send 0 to 0, send 1 to 1. Okay, but how is it getting us an inverse? Well, you compose two identities, and they're the identity. So the map goes to X. <laughs> that's an output. That's a point. Yeah, we're almost out of time, but I, I do think that maybe what we should do is we could either write it down, or we could have Luke go to the board and tell us what he was thinking. Or I can go to the board and pretend I understood Luke. <laughs> so I think he was doing this. He was saying the horn is a point, and it goes into the two points, which I'm just drawing to draw this picture, okay, that I know there's things between it. Now there's a map to any X, right? Um, no, sorry. It's, it's an X that satisfies the extent, the strong extension property. So there exists. So for this map alpha, there exists a map alpha bar that does this, and it has to send zero to the same place this one goes to. So star here goes to X star, okay? And that's the same place this one goes to. Now the other point. I should have just used the names already there. So 0 goes to x0, 1 goes to x1. And so there's an alpha and there's a beta. Alpha is this one. So now I know the name. So I'm catching up with my own notation. So now I'm getting there. Okay. Those are the two points in x that we talked about. It's the image under 0 under this map alpha. It's the image under 1 under this map beta. Okay. They both have extensions, alpha and beta. They both already told you where those two points go. So what else could they do on zero? So they have to send it so that they preserve the functor on this. And that's where zero goes to one, right? So then you have to send the thing that's below B to the only other point it could go to. So it has to send this one to that one. That's what the first extension has to do. The other one has to go the other way. There's just two points, and you've already locked up one of the points, so there's no other choices. I feel like that back there should be something in the middle between those two arrows. So like but there are no, there's only two points you can go to in X. Right? This is this is two points. Once you tell me where those go, then I have to be order preserving. That's the only information I have. So there shouldn't be any points in the middle, right? This is a combinatorial version of the points in the middle. There shouldn't be. And if there's only one place I can go, I mean, I suppose the concern could be, does, does beta bar, the concern could be, does beta bar actually equal beta 1, right? Does it not go down? And does alpha bar not go up, right? If that happened, sorry, alpha, those are the only points it can go to. And so it could choose to not go up or not go down, right? That has to somehow violate this commutativity. That's what we have to say. Because if it does, if it, if it has to be from this commutativity, then there's only one other place it could go, and then they are inverses of each other. Well, I don't see it. But I think that's, I'm now stuck there. So I, I took Luke's idea and hamburgered it to this point. So it's in there is an idea that's correct. Thank you, Luke. But I don't quite see the end game. But yeah, we'll figure it out. We have another week. And um, for those of you who have to go, go.